politicians are not going to do things that aren't popular. Yeah. So we have to make them popular for there to be a chance that we're going to get some political will around that. Yeah. So it is really up to us. Hello, everyone. Matt Goldman here from SSW TV. Today, I'm here with Richard Campbell. Hi. Hi, Richard. Thank you so much for coming in. Great to be here. Um, Richard, uh, I saw your presentation at NDC Sydney last week on the future of energy. Awesome. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit more about that. Great. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is, uh, you know, your, tech, your talk was really about the technology uh, uh, that, that's in use. And um, with the exception, I think, of uh, photovoltaics, in fact, let's take a step back. When we talk about electricity, we're talking about electrons moving through a wire. Yeah, right. there's more to it than that, but more or less. Yeah. Now, you spoke about a bunch of different technologies, mm -hmm. and with the exception of the photovoltaic cells, which, which work by the photoelectric effect, Yeah. so photons hit the cell and excite electrons to start moving along wires. Mm -hmm. Again, oversimplification. Yeah, but more importantly with photovoltaic, makes DC power natively. Yes, that's right. right? Yeah. Which yeah. is a distinction. Yeah, and that is because, with the exception of the photovoltaic cells, everything else that we're talking about is ultimately different methods of spinning a turbine. For the most part. I mean, some of them are direct drive, like some of those biomass plants and things, or any diesel plant generally is literally the motor attached to the generator. Right. But yeah. steam turbines are a preferred method for a couple of reasons. One is you can actually extract a lot of power from steam, but it's also a stabilizing effect on the on the grid as a whole. Those yeah. steam turbines are very steady, and it's an important part of making a reliable grid. Yeah. So the steam tur so so even with the direct drive, mm -hmm. the the turbine is still turning that motor. So what you have is effectively um, a coil of wire and a magnet that's spinning. Right in the generator. Yeah, in the generator. So we're using magnetic spinning magnetic field to move those electrons along the wire. Right, uh, and that's why you end up with the alternating current mm -hmm. um, as opposed to... So So my first question is, are photovoltaic cells really the only thing we have available that generates DC? Native DC, for the most part at scale, uh, generally the power that's produced by um, proton membrane exchange also can be DC power as well. Right. And also all the battery pack backup systems and peaker systems that we have would be you know, natively DC. And it, one of the big advantages with these DC options is that they are prone to, they're easy to insert into the grid in small increments because they can basically look at the AC sign you have and match it. When you're dealing with an array of steep turbines or even more challenging, we talk about like direct drive wind turbines where every single pair of set of blades represents its own generator. Each of those sine waves from each of those generators has to be aligned on the yeah. grid. It's a huge challenge to making a sophisticated grid. Yeah, yeah. I want to talk more about um, the grids a bit later on. Yeah. Um, but since you mentioned turbines, um, I thought it was interesting because I, I listened to this on your uh, your Geek Out as uh, as well. Earlier this year. Yeah. yeah, from January, I think. About January. Um, and you mentioned something, and then you mentioned in your talk as well, which is that one of the downsides of wind turbines is that they're noisy. Mm -hmm. um, now, I seem to, and I, honestly, I can't. And it, and it'd be true. All generators are noisy. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, now, I, I can't cite any studies off the top of my head, but I seem to recall um, there being some studies about turbines when they found that the noise that they that they make is, is, first of all, you have to pretty much be right underneath the turbine. You have to be relatively close, yeah. Yeah. So, so you know, people complaining about, um, yeah, we, we call them NIMBYs, right? Not in my backyard. Mm -hmm. People complaining about wind farms being built in their neighborhood. I, I mean, when we say they're noisy, it, it, does the noise really affect people living nearby? I mean, it's a great question. I've never had to live by a wind turbine. That is the common complaint, so I try not to ignore it, even though, you know, noise only propagates so far and, and, and so on. And part of this conversation was that wind technology is getting better and better, especially offshore in the yeah. ocean. And so the resistance that we're finding to wind is often the land-based turbines, the ones they can see. Yeah. And so can complain about, and the further away we can put them, the easier things get. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny, something I, I think Carl said in the Geek Out, which is that 
Yeah, people, because the other complaint about turbines is that they're unsightly on the landscape. Yeah. I think he mentioned sort of looking out over the sea and seeing them. I think that he thinks that would be quite cool. And I think that would be quite cool. I tend towards that as well, but I'm not everybody. That's true. But yeah, if you get an opportunity to go up into Denmark and take one of the ferries and just see these turbines stretching out across the ocean for miles, it's quite beautiful, I think. See, I think they're quite beautiful on the hillside as well. I think when you're driving through the countryside and you see them, especially you now you see them silhouetted, the spinning turbines, I, I, I think that's quite a nice Yeah. Thing. Like I said, I'm not, not everybody. We're not everybody, yeah. I'm for better or worse. Yeah. So so just um, uh, uh, again, talking about the offshore, because that seems to be, you know, significantly more efficient in terms of bang for buck. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, But costly. I mean, but it, costly, yeah. it's easy to put a post down in the ground, on the ground, and then build a tower from there. Although you only want to get so large in that scenario. The offshore wind, and really they talk about two forms, near shore and truly offshore. Yeah. And virtually every ocean-based uh, wind turbine you've seen is actually near shore. Yeah. Typically not more than 50 feet of uh, 50 meters of water. Yeah. And, and to mount that, they essentially shove a casement down into the water, right through to the, to the floor of the ocean, pump all that water out, and then drill a hole down, put in a bunch of concrete, and set the mast. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I guess uh, one of the... Uh, it, it, like you mentioned, you know, those, um, and I actually have some friends that, that, that do this for a job mm -hmm. and, you know, one of the, the things you need to do is go up the top of that, yep, that, those, that pylon and, those and generators maintain. generators need maintenance. Yeah. And, you know, I guess you're increasing the complexity and cost of that by having it on, you know, even near shore, let alone offshore. Mm -hmm. Um, although the, again, this, the, 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 the towers are, are hollow. They have stairs and often rudimentary elevators inside of them. Like it is a job. Yeah, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. All of those those equipment needs maintenance; it needs to be inspected, and it's part of the job to do that. Yeah. So, so uh, just um, uh, running with that, you know, needing maintenance thing. Mm -hmm. uh, one of one of the technologies that I've personally found very fascinating uh, is is solar thermal. Yes. Um, because I think first of all the efficiency compared to photo. Well, the photovoltaic cells are obviously a lot more efficient now. Than they were, you know, sort of twenty years ago. Yeah, we were pretty much stuck at the cell. the The popular cell that's very cost effective is about twenty two percent. There are more efficient ones, but they get dramatically more expensive, and their long term lifespans aren't well known. And that's a yeah. big concern if you're committing it to commercial scale. Twenty three percent that you know is going to work for twenty years is way more valuable than twenty nine percent that might work for twenty years. Yeah, that's yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, but just on, on the question of maintenance, something you said in your talk is about the, the solar thermal is that obviously each one of those, each one of the panels is on a little motor. The that heliostats. Needs, yeah, heliostats, right. yes. So in solar thermal, we're using mirrors to reflect the sun into a central point. I mean, that's one particular kind of solar thermal. Yep. It is a, a broader term, but that particular style of solar thermal uh, has the possibility to do 24-hour power generation, which is very interesting when we talk yeah. about base load power. But yeah, every heliostat has a two-axis motor. Yeah. So, so when you mentioned about these things being in the de desert where it's dusty and needing maintenance, mm -hmm. what, what I found was interesting was it was kind of almost in the context of when you were saying about where these are most useful is, is you know, I guess remote desert facilities like mines, for example, mm -hmm. uh, they, you know, they, whatever, you know, form of power generation they've got out there is, is still going to need maintenance. Yes. Um, you, it, where do you see the complexity or cost? in that maintenance compared to other more traditional? Tipi well, and if, so if you talk about a mine site, typically it, uh, there's really two approaches. The most common is they bring out a diesel electric generator. Yeah. Those are very self-contained machines. They're well known. Their maintenance plans are, are, are very uh, pl scheduled out. They're in a contained space. Like it's not that tough to run them. You don't have to move around a lot. A large heliostat installation is 10,000 heliostats. Yeah. And they're spread across kilometers. So it's a lot of moving around in the desert to, to do the work for each one and to keep mo more of those motors. These electric tend to be more contained. The alternative approach, once you have a working mine, especially if it's coal, is you're bleeding off the excess methane from the mine and doing cogeneration with that. And that would typically be a combined cycle generator, which is a little more efficient. Yeah. And again, small, reliable, well-known piece of technology um, that is rel you know, straightforward to maintain. Yeah, yeah. Because, I, I mean, I, I think, uh, as I said, I find solar thermal to be a, an interesting... Uh, yeah, and, a, you, and you would think with the amount of desert that you have in Australia, it should be a ringer. It should be. Although there was that slide you showed in your presentation, which was about the grid or lack thereof that we have here. So mm. so transporting is, of course, one of the one of the issues. Yes. But, but, you know, really, that's kind of a solved problem with AC. Um, and, well, 
and DC too. Like we have long range solutions for DC transport as well, but all of those infrastructures cost money. Yeah. And so it raises the overall cost, the overall LCOE, that levelized cost of energy. We talk about, I mean, it makes a lot of sense to put a whole lot of solar panels out in the desert too, where it's not going to bother anybody. Yeah. And then bring that power home in one form or another back to the cities where it's needed. Yeah. Uh, in the particular case of Australia, obviously you have the great dividing range and that makes it a little more difficult to transport that power. But a lot of that, that all that infrastructure, by the way, also needs maintenance. Yes, those, yeah. those towers need to be cared for. Uh, storms can damage them. The cables need routine inspection. Nothing's for free. Yeah. But, you know, it all has its benefits. Um, the bigger problem, I and I brought this up with solar thermal, is that most solar thermal plants are still using steam turbines. Yeah. Uh, and, and when you get into the molten salt approaches to collecting heat, and so these fluorine salts can get to very, very high and low temperatures. So they typically only molten at about 400 degrees centigrade, but they get over 1,000 then carry enough heat to run 24 hours a day. But they're actually almost too hot for water. You can make it work with steam, but you're kind of wasting the potential energy. Yeah. There are less mature but very efficient turbines like carbon dioxide-based turbines and helium-based turbines that might be a better solution and use that heat more efficiently. Yeah. I, I think that's, you know, again, that's that's one of the, the great... Um, one of the, the fascinating aspects of this technology is that you're not limited to just steam and, you mm -hmm. know, and you can find these different and, and but you bring up the you know an angle of this is that the power generation industry is very conservative and they tend to stick with very known practices because they're expected to for the minimum price provide 100 percent reliable power yeah. it's a tough balance to do the innovative technology that may have reliability problems versus known technology that you know what its potential is even if it's not as efficient yeah so I, i'm going to come back to that uh, a little bit um and i and i want to uh, talk about that a bit more but um I just, I just, uh, because seeing as you, you, you're speaking about, um, the fact that these things can run even when there's no sun because the, the, the heat is stored in the molten salts right. and they can run overnight. I thought it was interesting. Some of the other, um, solutions that you were discussing to problems of when energy isn't available from the source that's generating it to storing it. So in particular, um, with dams or, or, or where you're talking about, um, the pumped hydro. So right. you're actually, when you've got the, the surplus of energy. You're storing it as gravitational potential energy that's to right. then tap it later on. And, really, and, and that's still the largest form of stored energy we have for society so far. Yeah, yeah, which is, is great. You know? Well, and I'm blown away by how much work has been done in Australia to take existing hydroelectric dams and make them also into pump storage. Yeah. So, yeah. You, you know, you're, you're converting existing work that's already been done. Because building pump storage obviously needs a special location, someplace where we can hold water up high and bring it down low. But it also takes a lot of pipe work and yeah. optional equipment. So the fact that you've made it, Australia has these long-term investments in hydroelectric and then for adding a relatively small amount of equipment can turn them into pump storage as well. Yeah. Um, very uh, tangent here, but uh, have you have you read the Stormlight Archive? No, I have not. Okay. It just reminded me of something from mm -hmm. those those books. There's, um, I won't go into too much detail, but it's a series of fantasy novels and they have this source of power called Stormlight and they built these systems for where it runs out. So while they've got it, they use pulleys to drag these concrete blocks up to the top of the tower, and then they release them slowly to... And it, I've seen proposals for that concept, that crane-based uh, power storage. It's got problems. You know, it's a cool idea, except that you're spinning a generator for only the duration of the drop, and then you've got to kind of switch to another one. So there's an awful lot of power switching to make those things work. Yeah. It's hard to justify or to actually get good results from. Yeah. And in fact, um, yeah. you spoke about power switching uh, a lot in your in your talk, actually, with, with the various technologies that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the, uh, the comparison in how well that works between the different technologies. And uh, I guess also with the... the, the the turbines that you were talking about, the fact that they take several minutes to spin down. Yes, they give you room to switch a little more gracefully. Yeah. Well, and more importantly, that's what most power companies are familiar with. Yeah. We have steam turbines. They are our carry, that time for switching sources. We don't have to put in additional technology for that. Mm. There are other solutions. Most um, diesel electric generator plants usually have a flywheel attached them as well, which is another way to store potential energy. Yeah. So when you want to switch between generators, which is not that uncommon, you'll count on the flywheel to do the bridge. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's talk about nuclear. Um, uh, Hot topic in Australia. Yeah. In a way, you know, it's very interesting. You guys are one of the top producers of uranium for the world. You don't use any of it yourself. Yeah. It's interesting. And and I think there's, there's potentially a reason for that, which is something I'm 
going to come back to and ties into something you were saying earlier sure. about the industry being conservative. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's because it, it's interesting in that, you know, we're talking about there's two forms of, of creating nuclear energy. One is fission, one is fusion. Mm-hmm. Um, fission, you know, obviously we've been doing for uh, 80 years. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, we know it works. Mm-hmm. Um, generally, we know it's safe. Um, so we've had some issues, but really those are issues that, that can be managed. And, you know, as you described with Fukushima should have been managed. Yes. I mean, in every case, you're finding multiple failures. And when you're able to talk about a, a nuclear disaster of any kind, there's multiple failures. Yeah. Um, which is true of like what, how difficult, how rare it is to have a, an airliner crash. Many failures have to happen to lose an airliner. Um, I, I would argue one of the advantages of getting involved in the technology now is that most of those problems have been resolved. Yeah. That there's no reason for you to go back to the mistakes of the past, but to use the most modern technology that's available to you. Yeah. So so the the two big remaining problems with, with nuclear fission-based energy production are storage of waste uh, and the fact that it's still a, a, a finite resource. So it's not renewable in that sense. Uh, now, with regard to the first one, you mentioned about reprocessing. Yes. Um, so to, to what extent does that alleviate some of the um, storage of waste uh, uh, issues that we have with nuclear? Um, it, I mean, reprocessing fuel is a smart thing to do. Typically with a light water reactor design, and I'm generalizing here, you only consume about uh, one half of 1% of the, of the fuel as energy at the end of a typical run, which six months to a year depends on the kind of power plant. And so... In the end, what you're left with is mostly uranium still. And so reprocess that is getting the uranium back. And that, in the early days of nuclear power, was a very normal practice until we found that there was a lot more uranium around than we realized, and it became cheaper to just excavate new uranium and make new rods than to reprocess the other rods. So that I'm talking about America primarily. But if you want a good example of that, you look at France, mm. who generates the majority of the electricity via nuclear power. And they always reprocess their fuel. And one of the reasons they do that is some of the waste brought by products of these fuels are very dangerous, things like plutonium. Uh, and it's one of the reasons that technology was matured is back at, the, at a time when we wanted to more nuclear weapons in the world, they took advantage of that plutonium. We've stopped that practice, right? Both in, in France and in Germany, they process that plutonium back into their fuel rods and they burn it. So the reality with good fuel reprocessing is that you end up with very little high waste. For the amount of material you're using, because you keep reprocessing, you end up with a small amount of high waste and some uh, low waste. And those are all very storageable. And they don't take up a lot of space compared to the emissions that come from a coal power plant, which we largely just allow into the atmosphere. So here we've got a waste that's very contained. We have manageable solutions to it. You need a certain amount of space to deal with it in the right kind of ground. But with the exception of the, of the United States, which has to be the loudest place for these kinds of problems, most countries that depend on power have good vitrification solutions, so how they package to protect you from that waste, and storage solutions. Yeah. So it's a known problem and, and, and with known solutions, Matt. It's just a, the, the noisiest parts of that are the ones that are doing it the poorest. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, these, you know, ultimately, well, in fact, let, let's let's take a step back. So the reason that we're having this conversation at all, right, is because we're trying to solve a problem and that problem is emissions. Yes. Okay. So, you know, in, in order to reduce emissions, in fact, you know, we really need to go beyond net zero and get into net negative, depending on who you talk to. Yeah. Um, it, but in order to solve these problems, we need to move from generating, from sources of, that generate power that have high emissions to those that have low emissions. Right. Okay. So, you know, I, I mean, you know, really, you know, to do that, we need, we need to have people not afraid to invest in doing that. And when I say people, I mean, governments and corporations, right. right? Um, and in order for, on the government side, at least people need to not be afraid of that technology. Well, pol- politicians are not going to do things that aren't popular. Yeah. So we have to make them popular for there to be a chance that we're going to get some political will around that. Corporations are inherently conservative and power companies doubly so. And so until there is a groundswell that says we want these things and we were going to provide some support for those things, they're not going to do. Them. So yeah. it is really up to us to make enough noise to say this is a good solution. Like, let's do more with it. Yeah. And that's that's something that's, I think, difficult to do at the moment sure um because it, like there's you know i guess there's a lot of fud around uh 
But yeah, I mean, we haven't, you know, you spent mentioning your talk about fusion, you know, we're not there yet, but no. when fusion comes along, I imagine, do you remember when they turned on the Large Hadron Collider and people said that there's going to be a black we're hole? We're going to make a black hole, yes. Yeah. You know, so I expect when we start to, you know, turning on fusion reactors, there's going to be similar things like that. And then, of course, as I mentioned with fission, there's a lot of fear about, you know, meltdowns and, and safe disposal of right. waste. It, it issues of the past that need to be resolved in more modern ways and have been resolved. You know, yeah. the, we now have certified small modular nuclear reactors, these kinds that are too small to actually have enough thermal mass to melt their containers and can be re re routinely reprocessed in a cost-effective way lower risk and continuous improvement as well. Yeah. So, so what I'm interested in finding out is, um, uh, or, or talking more about is, is you mentioned, um, in your talk, uh, a guy that used to work for Tesla that set up an, his own company. Mm. You've mentioned, I, I can't remember whether it was in your talk, but I, it was definitely in the geek out about, um, you know, some, some organizations working with universities, um, in the U S um, I, that might've been around the fusion. So, yeah, this Commonwealth Fusion out of MIT, which seems to be a much more modern approach to fusion reactors, but still, you know, a long way away. Um, the fellow that worked at, with, formerly with Tesla, that is the iron air battery, which yep. is much more of a grid thinking battery. So Tesla's done us all a great service, and certainly Australia's taking advantage of that, to mature the lithium ion battery to the point where they're making these large scale mega packs, including the one in Victoria and, and, uh, and elsewhere. So now that we know that, that battery packs can help a grid, why do we make a better grid battery? Yeah. Because a lithium ion battery is not actually a grid battery. Their natural discharge system, uh, state is about six hours, not long enough for the grid. One of their key features is how light they are, not an important thing for grid. I mean, it's good for cars, yeah. but it's not really a thing that's great for grid. And so the iron air batteries have problems, but those problems aren't an issue for grid. They, yeah. they tend to be large, they tend to be heavy, they tend to be hot. Those are all things that can be fixed with a fence. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But they also tend to be inexpensive and long lived. Their typical discharge cycle is about a hundred hours, much more feasible for, for, uh, what a grid would need. Yeah. So <laughs> aside from the technology problems, um, the problems that I perceive with this are really uh, are political and commercial. So, you know, you mentioned that these organizations are conservative. I think there's, there's potentially, um, a step beyond that as well, which is not just, you know, organizations being risk averse, but there are a lot of organizations that have got deep investments in some of these, um, you know, more traditional power sources. Sure. Um, and you know, there is, there is a lot of lobbying, um, and you know, I really don't want to go deep into the, you know, the history of it, but you know, we know, for example, that, um, Exxon and friends back in the 1970s planned a campaign. There's a pamphlet that you can read that, that to, to, you know, spread climate denialism. Mm -hmm. We know that, um, we know that there was a, in fact, it was famously a 97% consensus among uh, climate scientists about what's happening with climate and it being human caused. I think that's now actually 99%. Yes. Um, but, you know, there was a, an interesting quote from someone on the BBC recently. She, she said that, you know, you, you'd find 100 experts on one side, um, but, you know, you could only find one on the other. So you'd bring them both on and it presents as a balanced argument. Yeah, there was a, it was a great, uh, a great newscast where they said, we can't bring one and one. Let's bring the hundred and the one. Yeah, exactly. You know, to actually show that proportionality that yeah. it is it, it is an interesting challenge. And, and it's not, this hasn't got a lot to do specifically with power or climate per se, but a general attack on the scientific method that, uh, and, and the challenges around things like social media that has provided a lot more information to people, but also challenge them to actually sort and understand it well. Yeah. You know, we used to have far more restricted resources for information. And the gatekeeping for that information naturally improved its quality. Yeah. You know, there was always a debate about whether Wikipedia was going to be as good as you know, Encyclopedia Britannica because the experts that made Britannica naturally was a higher quality product. It panned out. Wikipedia has its problems, but its size sort of overwhelmed that. And generally the quality was pretty good. Yeah. I think we're in the midst of this battle and, and you bring up a really important point, which is that, and the bad actors have learned to use those tools too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But for the most part, if you look at it as a whole, the truth does tend to come out. Yeah, it, I'm sure it does. And, and yeah, I, I guess I, I, I do have faith in that, but what concerns me is the amount of money being invested in convincing people that newer sources of energy and generation are bad and old ones are good. And what my specific question is, is, you know, now that we've got, um, you know, effectively, uh, I guess a, a spinoff from 
the company that's owned by the richest man in the world. Yeah. And the richest man in the world is now obviously heavily invested in electric power and electric cars. Mm -hmm. Do you see that having an impact there? And in fact, do you see there being in any investment uh, in, I guess, countering misinformation in that sense? Yeah, I think it's a, a constant challenge. I think there's certainly forces measuring on all of those things. Uh, I, you know, I think Elon has good days and bad days. It seems to be a string of bad ones lately. Um, Let's not talk about Twitter. Yeah, and it's but it's I don't envy the man either. It's a tough place to be, you know, to yeah. you know, because your power nobody's power is unlimited. Yeah, and but it's easy to fool yourself, especially when surrounded by folks that that pr press all that upon you. But you know, he really said he started Tesla with the point of proving the electric car was viable, and arguably he's achieved that when you see companies like Volkswagen making a proper electric car. I mean, that's a really serious, mature car company making a real electric car now. Like our world is generally made in advance there. Yeah. It is not just the renegade that's doing that. And I think the same is true for these power packs is that he wanted to show that this was a good business and he was making a superior battery and arguably still is making a superior battery. But there are different species of battery. He's not going to be able to compete with lithium iron batteries. What is well served from an iron, ba an iron air battery? It's a different technology. Mm. But I guess, you know, the... the the, the parallel is that in uh, the automotive industry, you've got a, a number of companies that have got decades and decades of deep investment in, you know, production lines that build internal combustion engines, yeah. right? So, you know, forward thinking car manufacturers could have 30 years ago started building electric cars, yeah. but of course they didn't. And it takes an outsider to come along and it say, it yeah. worked. Yeah. And now you've got these conservative car companies forced into actually being able to real electric cars, yeah. which is phenomenal. So, you know, and I, and I try to phrase that situation around the power packs exactly the same way. The Tesla proved that grid scale battery storage was feasible with a battery that wasn't ideal for it. And it just opens the door to the possibility that, that, a, that a company like Form Air can get the financing to actually make those better suited batteries. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out over, um, I guess, the next couple of decades. Um, you know, I think certainly uh, with the school strike, we've seen that it's proven that younger people care about this more. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess when they become more influential and a voting age and of, you know, corporation um, age, you yeah. know, we, we, we might see some, some, we'll see some more, yeah. you know, many of these generations are more engaged on that as well. I mean, we, we're definitely seeing a new generation coming into politics already. They may not be as young as the young folks that are just getting into voting age now, but they are younger than the generation before. And so they they have a different set of values that can be swayed and I'm optimistic. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Um, I want to uh, get, uh, so we've spoken a little bit about the technology. We've spoken a bit about, I guess, political and commercial mm -hmm. motivations. I want to talk about some of the practicalities that you've raised. Um, so uh, <clears throat> you spoke a bit about smart grid, right. uh, the concept of a smart grid. And this is something I've been interested in for a while. Um, and what you were talking about was, you know, appliances uh, choosing effectively the cheapest time of the day to run. So. Right. So at the moment, like I, I time, I put my dishwasher and my washing machine on a timer. And I run them overnight. I'll right. Peak. So you're doing the hard work for us, right? Yeah. Yeah. But you know, these, these, these but when you talk about, yeah, but, but then that's really within my household, right? Mm -hmm. And everyone starts doing that. Then, you know, the peak load becomes between, you know, 10 PM and 6 AM or where, whatever it is. Right. Yeah. I, I'm hoping we are having a good enough software to actually sort through all of the machines and balance that load well. That's right. Yeah. So, so that's what I was, what I was kind of getting at is that when you've got a smart grid, it, it's really not the, the power grid, but it's the grid of appliances. So this is really when we talk, when we talk about the internet of things, Yes. this is what we're talking about. So, so all of these devices communicating with each other and coordinating. So maybe not on individual device level, but you know, say blocks, uh, you know, a block yep. of houses, they like say, you know, you guys run, you know, you know, 10 till midnight and then you guys run. Is that is that the kind of the, out, the sort of algorithms that we're talking about? I think we can get to that. There's a bunch of different ways to solve that peer to peer problem. So they, I mean, nothing else. The rate, the power rate is being set by consumption in the first place. So our whole idea here is that power's cost varies by the hour. We could play with what that unit actually should be, and different places have approached this differently anyway. And then to say they have the appliance say, well, what's my lowest cost of power? And as load comes onto that, that price is going to change. So you automatically have this sort of sense of, oh, 3 a.m. is getting costly now. It probably makes more sense to move to 1 a.m. because we've, we've shifted price. Because you're trying to just levelize that grid. You don't want any peaks and valleys because that'll cut down on the number of power plants we need. We want steady amount of power consumption all the time. 
but I've already talked to folks working in places like the Netherlands where they've done that balancing for charging electric cars for exactly that reason. So these are solvable problems. There's more than one way to solve them. We just got to pick one. So um, that um, so again, talking about practicalities, talk, uh, you, you mentioned electric cars. Mm -hmm. One of the big problems with electric cars, in fact, it, it, the biggest problem is cost, right? So we're talking about Tesla being a proof of concept. Yes. Um, but it's not really a car for the massive masses. But some of those other conservative car manufacturers are working on that. Mm -hmm. I think it, it, I think uh, I've heard the number thirty thousand dollars being the kind of a magic threshold. threshold. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we're getting there, right? Yeah. But the, the, uh, at the lower level, it's we look at the cost per kilowatt for a battery pack. There's sort of thresholds they've gone after. Is, and one of them was, we could get it below $100 per kilowatt hour. Yeah. And that number was was reached a couple of years ago. And it's like, okay, well, this is these are the tipping points we're looking for, that we try and reduce those initial construction costs so we can get the price right. And then you just figure out what's the right vehicle. Yeah. And if it all those pieces. So all those things are coming together. Yeah. So in terms of practicality, the, the, the other problem, aside from cost, is the time it takes to charge, right? Yes. So if I stop at a petrol station and I fill up my tank, it takes me maybe three minutes. Mm -hmm. um, but to charge a car, it takes overnight. Depending on your charger, right? I mean, yeah. the Tesla, again, has shown the way on that with their superchargers, where you can get 50 60% of your charge in 15 minutes, which yeah. is astonishingly good. But it's a lot of sophistication in that. You're kind of telling the car in advance, I need to go charge. And it actually preps the batteries for uh, when you get to that charger to optimize its charging rate. Uh, that kind of sophistication needs to be spread further. So in, in, so in terms of solving that problem, or I guess alleviating that problem, is the solution going to be sophistication around planning journeys and planning where and when you charge? Or do you see a faster charging option being on the technological horizon? We're continuing to see new improvements in faster and faster charging strategies, different voltage techniques, different cooling techniques, like all the things that we can do to get the battery charged quickly and also not damage the battery in the process. So I think those times are going to continue to compress. Yeah. But we're also seeing that folks are thinking differently about how they travel and thinking about uh, and what the car can actually help you with as you plan those things. So more places to charge, make it easier to charge. Certainly home charge is going to continue to be a thing, if not a bigger thing. But I don't imagine a revolution here for no other reason than we're far enough committed now worldwide to a charging strategy that we're just not that far away from a battery that charges fast enough, capacities that are large enough that you don't have range anxiety, you get used to your battery not being fully charged all the time because it can go as far as you need it to, and then still charging reasonably at home. Yeah. I mean, there's, yeah, I mean, look, you know, change, changing the way we think about our journeys is, is obviously a big step, mm -hmm. but you know, like, you know, there's some, some other practicalities as well. So you mentioned, I don't think you talked about it in your talk, but in the geek out, you spoke about hydrogen fuel cells yeah. and why, you know, the industry didn't really go that way. But one of the things you can do with a hydrogen fuel cell is swap it out. Theoretically. Theoretically. You, in theory, you could swap a battery out too. It's just that you get a whole lot of inefficiencies when you do that, that kind of undermine the results. Yeah. You know, they've done a good job with battery packs of really integrating them into the car so they're not modular and easy to remove. The modular battery is smaller and has less range. Get into ownership issues around that. Yeah. I mean, really, a hydrogen fuel cell, you don't so much switch the cell as you switch the medium that you're changing, typically some kind of uh, hydrogen format, hydrogen hydrides. There's, there's a bunch of different ways to do that. The problem is that fuel cells are expensive. The technology is complex and it's fragile. And, and so it's, you know, the, the Toyota company is trying with the Mira for many years to make hydrogen really work. And they know more than anyone. And it's still a challenge. Yeah. Um, I, inherently, I don't think it's any better. Uh, it's very tough to fuel a hydrogen car too. Yeah. I know it, it works very high pressures uh, or it works with particular compounds and a certain amount of heat. So it takes a while to charge those things uh, as well. And I don't think they can catch up from the cost perspective. Yeah. Uh, I do so, think the hydrogen economy is going to continue for certain aspects. Uh, and we're getting better at making hydrogen in less destructive ways. Um, but it's going to be tough to get make it in the car. Yeah. So so putting aside hydrogen versus, you know, batteries or, mm -hmm. or lithium ion batteries. Um, if I'm driving my car now and I run out of fuel halfway up the freeway. Yes. I can call roadside assistance and they can come with a little can of petrol yep. and give me enough to get to the next petrol station. Right. Right. With an electric car, can, you know, do you foresee, um, you, know, you know, our roadside assistance guys having, you know, little trucks with batteries on the back? It already exists. Yeah. yeah. Different, in different communities, different places, those things exist. Did you, did you see the TV show, The Long Way Up? 
Yes. Yeah. So I, I noted that in that they had literally a truck that was a giant battery that was driving yeah. around and giving them. Well, they were doing all those things with Rivians back in before they were even a commercial vehicle yet. Yeah, that's right. And so yeah. yeah, they're definitely. There's an. Uh, they. This is very reasonable that our modern auto support systems will start bringing batteries where they're needed. Yeah. Or perhaps a fuel cell that generates electricity very efficiently for a dedicated vehicle. It's an expensive one-off vehicle. Not everybody's going to have one, but it might be just the way to generate enough electricity to get people back to their chargers. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. and, uh... It's an, you know, you realize we've had hundreds of years to develop the gas station and the automobile support infrastructure. And we've only had a few where electric cars have been important enough that we want to develop that same infrastructure for them as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, speaking of Rivian and that show, you know, Rivian actually went all up, you know, the highway of the Americas and installed these charges mm -hmm. for the show. So uh, I wonder if we need a similar, uh, you know, impetus to get something like that done. And it's essentially in the early days of the gasoline car, the same thing that happened, right? That there was an impetus to put in more gas stations and get more people involved. I think one of the things we're stumbling with is that because the electric car is still, still kind of an elite vehicle, that in many places you're putting these chargers, nobody has one. It's only for folks that are passing through, and that creates its own problems. Like, we have to get past that into more of the utility vehicle. I, for one, was delighted when Ford made the electric F-150. Yeah. Because it's such a utility vehicle. It's still early days. Like, clearly, that first gen of the F-150 is not a perfect vehicle by any stretch of imagination. But at some point, that's going to be the truck that people trust, as it has been for decades. Yeah. How about just in an electric form? And maybe the one of the pieces that moves it over to charging points are normal yeah yeah i i, I chuckled a bit then because it kind of reminded me of uh yeah windows phone right yep so you know to, to for windows phone to have been successful it needed apps and for, for it to have apps it needed be yeah, successful need yeah exactly yeah <laughs> so now i think the difference with with you know electric cars is that it, it you know it, they don't really have a choice about whether they're successful or not because governments are slowly starting to say or no more I, you know no more ice engines yeah in cars by you know x date Surprisingly, I you know I, I thought that um, this would have happened earlier, mm. um, uh, but you know I guess as we said about you know the the, the industry is being conservative and of course having the deep existing investments in the the other technology. Well, and you got to make it popular enough that that politicians want to make those kinds of announcements, which we seem to have crossed that threshold. Now. Yeah, yeah. It's a, did you know that uh, Australia was I, I'm pretty sure that Australia was the first country in the world to ban incandescent light bulbs. It's interesting. I did not know that. Yeah, I'm a big LED fan myself, but only yeah. good ones. Yeah, and this was back in the 1990s, and and I think if we still had that sort of progressive political will, now we we could have been the first to ban internal combustion engine cars, but we weren't. In it, fact, it, we still haven't. We it, it has been a challenging time in politics in general the past decade or so, and we're still shaking off the consequences of that. Um, to be able to focus on, I think, the larger issues of our time, and one of those being managing our emissions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Richard. I, uh, that was has been a really great discussion, and you know we could probably talk for hours more about this. Probably could, and um, I'm sure we will one day. <laughs> yes, you bet. But um, look, it's been great having you here, and I've really, I really enjoyed uh, your geek out, and I really enjoyed the show, and I've really enjoyed talking to you again today. So thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, this is Richard Campbell, and I'm Matt Goldman for SSW TV. Thank you.